Good evening and thank you for joining tonight's town hall conversation on the state of the people with public advocate Jamani Williams. As the second ranking elected official in New York City, the public advocate acts as an ombudsman speaking to the needs of New Yorkers, a voice of the people. I'm honored to moderate a conversation with him to lift up those voices in just a few moments. But first, the public advocate will share his perspective on the state of the people. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you all, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for what I know will be an honest conversation with New Yorkers here in this room and around the city about our greatest needs and greatest opportunities in this moment. Throughout this week, my office has held events to engage the community around some of the most urgent issues we face as the city on housing, education, transportation, incarceration. And tonight, I want to focus on an issue that is the top of New Yorkers' minds and media almost daily. As we discuss the state of the people, it's past time to discuss the state of public safety. The people have a right to be safe, and the people have a right to feel safe. Our government has a role to play in protecting each of these rights and protecting public safety for New Yorkers. Yet, the state of public safety in New York is, at best, uncertain. Safety and security are at the front of New Yorkers' minds and at the heart of their concerns. Physical safety, yes, but also financial security. In an affordability crisis that has made our city the most expensive in the world, half of all New York City families are unable to even afford the minimum cost of living here. People can't make ends meet or see an end to the compounding crises that brought us to this point. Every day on our screens or our streets, we see the consequences of crises and cruelty, in gun violence, in homelessness, in pain, and poverty. And some elected officials and media have played a role in fueling and fanning false perceptions of public safety. Despite the fact that New York is among the safest big city in the nation, statistics mean nothing to the victims of crime I know, and they have done little to calm the citywide anxiety around public safety to this point. The truth is that right now, New Yorkers are scared and their fears are real. I'm scared too. I'm scared because I think we have an opportunity now, finally, after years of even decades of resistance to explore, reimagine, and implement a more comprehensive and effective public safety effort. I think we have a moment when people are listening a moment when we could be united behind a holistic approach to public safety, when the premises and programs we have advocated for so many years could have their greatest impact. And I'm scared that we will miss the moment, or more specifically, misuse it. Instead of using this heightened awareness of, and concern about public safety to get at the true root causes, in the last week, months, and years, I've seen leaders respond by pushing policies that prey on those fears rather than treating their underlying causes. They often speak about and act on public safety in ways that fuel those fears instead of quelling them, whether out of cynical effort to drive a narrative, a desperate response to headlines and criticism, or even a misguided effort to truly provide support. But this rhetoric does more to damage to public safety than any of the policies they oppose. If part of government's responsibility is to help New Yorkers feel safe, our leaders are failing. But what about actually being safer? In order to improve public safety, we have to align policies, programs, and funding. The state budget was just passed. The city budget is in its final weeks of negotiation. And I'm scared that we will continue patterns of the past which rely on a faulty notion and narrative about what public safety is. First and foremost, public safety is not simply about law enforcement or the criminal legal system. That's an attitude and a narrative that has brought us to the place we are today and led to policies that inflicted decades of harm, policies people are still apologizing for today. Law enforcement has a role to play in public safety. Yes, they are a partner in public safety, but their role has to be limited in scope and grounded in accountability. Yet we ask our police to do way too much, to take on responsibilities best left to other agencies better equipped for them. Even the areas that are best equipped for such as immediate threats of gun violence can only be achieved in collaboration with community-led solutions. The role we give police and public safety is overwhelming, and the money we give them is overwhelming. And in our budget priorities, 
We need to align spending so other services have what they need. No one inciting public safety panic today would count the historically highest police communities in our city among the safest. Still, people oversimplify and equate policing and public safety today because that's what they're told by leaders and reinforced by media and culture. Over time, we have created a culture of stigmatizing rather than supporting people in need. A culture of fear and dehumanization that means people are shot on suspicion for going to a neighbor's house. One where a man is desperate, in desperate need of food, housing, and mental health care is strangled on the subway. One where it's controversial to say that those actions are wrong. One where people are viewed as a threat because of their identity or their income or systemic circumstance that damages their own sense of safety. This is not something you can meet with more police or more restrictive bail laws, and it's not public safety. We have to ask, what is, what is safety? Safety is coming home to housing that has heat and hot water, not mold or roaches. It's knowing that you can pay rent and won't face unjust eviction or unethical rent increases, that your home is secure from foreclosure or deed theft. A budget that doesn't increase the number of inspectors, one that doesn't adequately support the physical and mental health of tenants, forcing more people onto the streets and into shelters, is a threat to public safety. Safety is knowing you can send your children to school throughout their educational journey, which meet their needs in the moment and provide continued opportunities to learn and grow from early childhood to adulthood. It's knowing that children have access to the services that will keep them in school and out of danger. It's access to youth jobs for students and fair wage jobs for their families. A budget that cuts public school seats, cuts social workers, and focuses on punitive practices rather than restorative ones is a threat to public safety. Safety is living without the threat of cancer, asthma, and other health issues caused by pollutants that cloud our city. It's traveling that city on rapid, reliable public transportation and moving through the streets without the fear of traffic violence. It's the security of homes and neighborhoods that are equipped to protect against ever more frequent catastrophic weather events. A budget that fails to invest in green infrastructure, green transportation, or green spaces, one that does not increase safety inspections of existing, aging buildings and infrastructure, is a threat to public safety. Safety is access to services and supports for mental health, to treating mental health concerns and preventing dangerous mental health crises. It's the confidence that if you need help in a mental health emergency, you'll be met with peers and providers, not just police. It's the comfort that services, not stigma, will be the response of not just the government, but those around you. That a crisis of public health will be met with sufficient resources on an individual and systemic level. A budget that focuses on removing, detaining, criminalizing, and dehumanizing people in crisis and fails to provide adequate personnel or programming is a threat to public safety. Safety is access to common sense protections, adaptations, and health care as we continue to recover from a pandemic that we are learning to live with, but we cannot ignore. Safety is the ability to come here seeking asylum and be met with the compassion and resources needed, not to find relief in, the heart, in hardship, to be, to, a hardship to be treated as a burden or a bargaining trip. It's knowing that your needs won't be pitted against the needs of others, and a budget that positions marginalized people against one another is a threat to public safety. Safety is knowing that your government works on your behalf and that it's working at all. That the staff, services, and systems which power our city and empower its residents are strong. A budget that prioritizes austerity for the sake of image, that puts looking good over doing good, is a threat to public safety. With this budget, we have an opportunity to invest in public safety policies that will meet our mandate to help New Yorkers be safe and feel safe and last beyond any news cycle or administration. This is the real work of public safety. It's less easily accepted or explained in an environment of short headlines and long political campaign seasons. But it's work we have to commit to and stand by. We can't bend to the political environment or prevailing narrative. We have to shape it and demand our leaders do the same with all populations and all communities across our city. New Yorkers have a right to go to school without fear of being struck by a stray bullet, a right to walk the streets without being harassed or intimidated, a right to play and shop and work and live free from the threat of fear or danger, 
but we have to ask the right questions to implement the right solutions. What are the root causes? What's truly going to keep people safe? Locking up the communities and children of the people we criminalized in past decades or lifting those communities and children up? And scapegoating, strawmanning, equivocating, dismissing proven policies as woke or people pushing for change as agitators to be ignored? That's not public safety. That's public posturing. I'm proud to be an agitator, and I'm agitated now as I see words and decisions that undermine the safety of our neighbors in order to save a few dollars or to save face. For all the purported focus on safety, this proposed budget is dangerous, and I will continue to push back on behalf of the people. Because even in the face of uncertainty, adversity, and fear, I remain hopeful. I remain hopeful that conversations with this administration will lead to change of policies, of minds, and of the narrative. That conversation with New Yorkers will help to build consensus and coalition around true public safety, a dialogue I'm excited to have tonight through the budget season and beyond as we build a movement. Because when it comes to the state of the people, in solidarity, there is safety. And we can produce true, sustained safety for all New Yorkers, the agitated and the fearful, the hopeful and the exhausted, the uneasy and the undeterred can find peace. So for the second portion of our program tonight, the public advocate will be speaking directly with New Yorkers here in our studio, taking questions on a range of issues related to the state of the people of New York City. We'll not be, we will not be able to hear from everyone in the room tonight, but I also ask New Yorkers watching at home to share their questions and reactions on social media with the hashtag PeoplesNYC and SOTP to 2023. Public advocate, good to see you again. Great to see you. Thank you so much. You know, um, <clears throat> you really spelled out public safety, and you and I have talked about this in interviews before, and you said in your speech, we have to ask the right questions. So I want to start with this question. What is the biggest obstacle to public safety right now? I believe the biggest obstacle is um, fear works. Uh, fear has worked for some time. And many of our leaders, the biggest concern is sometimes just getting reelected. And that means instilling fear, even if that's not the best thing to do. Uh, and I always say people have a right to be safe and feel safe. And we don't quite get to both of those things all of the time. And it really takes some courage to take the time out to walk people through what, walk people through what public safety is. But I tell you, in, I've been elected for 13 years now. I have never seen a population of folks more ready to receive that message than right at this moment in time. And my hope is that our leaders will not squander that moment because we have an opportunity to do something that we have never really done. What we normally do is say, you know what the answer is? Let's just throw some police at it. Let's lock up as many black and brown folks as possible and we'll call it safety. But it has never worked. Um, and people now understand that public safety is a holistic approach. And they're ready for it. And you mentioned holistic approach. So what can New Yorkers do to help realize this holistic approach, this vision that you just presented? Well, you know, the, the uh, Adams administration actually did a survey last year asking what people th thought they should do about public safety. The first two answers were housing and mental health. Uh, law enforcement came in, I believe, third. And that really said to me, people understand this. Some of, some of the leaders need to catch up. And so my hope is that as this budget is being passed and being pushed through, folks can talk to their council members, they can reach out to the mayor, they can reach out to me, both president, elected official, and let them know what they want to see in the budget. Let them know that housing is integral to them, that mental health is integral, and they don't want to see law enforcement necessarily responding to mental health crises, people in acute mental health uh, problems, but they want to make sure that the Department of Mental Health has the funding they need to do that. Okay, let's bring in some of our studio audience, and we have our first uh, person who's going to ask a question now. Hello. Hello. Thank you for your service, public advocate. Hello, I am Salima Tudumbuya, the CUNY student trustee and chairperson of the CUNY University Student Senate. Do you think that defunding CUNY is a public safety issue? If yes, what are you doing as CUNY advocate to prevent that and ensure more funding for CUNY? And how can CUNY students, faculty, and staff support that cause? Well, thank you for the work that you do for CUNY. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. And you know, as you know, I'm a, 
um, CUNY uh, twice over, mm -hmm. bachelor's and uh, master's, Brooklyn College, City University of New York. One of the first uh, reports we did was actually on CUNY, uh, showing how CUNY helps move people into the middle class as an engine that nothing else does. And I do believe it's a public safety issue. Uh, education definitely is a public safety issue. <coughs> Excuse me. Getting people into better stations is a public safety issue. Um, I believe CUNY should be free. Uh, and it was free until uh, the 1970s. Uh, the complexion of who was going to CUNY changed, and then they started charging. Uh, that's probably a conversation for another time. <laughs> but the greatest expansion of CUNY happened during the Great Depression, when there was no money at all. And that's because people thought, in order to get out of that situation, we have to educate the masses. This thing still, still applies. If we could have the greatest expansion of CUNY during the Great Depression, we can move back to a time where people can access a quality education for free. And that really is about priorities in the budget. And CUNY students should keep uh, fighting and pushing. My first civil disobedience arrest was actually fighting, for, uh, tuition, fighting against a tuition increase mm. in the 90s. You've always been an activist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have another question from a member of our studio audience. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Good Jessica afternoon. Belinder. I'm a supervisor with the Legal Aid Society Bronx Neighborhood Office. And our question for you this evening is, uh, what will you be doing to advocate before the Rent Guidelines Board, which has, as a body, preliminarily voted for an unacceptably high range of rent increases for one- and two-year leases? You know, they started with, I believe, 16%. Uh, and I said, they started with 16%, so when they give you eight, it does sound like they did you a favor. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Housing is actually where I first started as a housing organizer, um, uh, tenant organizing, uh, to housing chair in the, in the city council to now. And I continue to push to make sure people understand that, like, literally right now, it seems like uh, two groups of folks uh, folks who uh, deal with our uh, utilities and landlords, whenever they have an issue or they have some kind of issue they have to uh, pay bills, they can go to customers and they can go to tenants. But where do the customers and the tenants go? Mm. And that's, that's a problem. And so we have been saying you can't raise money on tenants right now. We are, by the way, the highest uh, rent, uh, rent, um, rent it, we have the highest rent in the world, many studies show, definitely in the United States of America. And we have the worst housing stock, according to a, a report that we put out. So worst housing stock, more rent. We have historic homelessness, but you want to raise rent. That doesn't make any sense. But, and they always put the small landlords in the front but, to make it uh, sympathetic. When actually, they're usually black and brown small landlords, they should be on the side of the tenants but, uh, saying we all need some assistance. And I do believe that there are uh, uh, responsible owners out there that may need some assistance. Government needs to really step in and help everybody but, because you're not going to solve the problem by trying to get money from people who absolutely don't have it and you just make the homelessness crisis worse. Okay. And now next to her, we have another uh, question. Thank you for your comments earlier about compassion and care. Um, my name is Jason Wu. I'm the attorney in charge of Legal Aid's Harlem Community Law Office. And I wanted to ask you, what are you doing in terms of monitoring the humanitarian emergency response and relief centers and the shelter system to support asylum seekers? I know you've been at Port Authority along with our colleagues um, regarding recent arrivals. Yeah, I've visited <coughs> Port Authority numerous times. I've visited some of the shelters a, f uh, a few times. You know, I, I try to remind folks, first of all, migration is a, a human thing. Uh, it seems to be... Uh, People's perception changes after they've migrated and got what they need, and then they kind of look differently at other folks. But that, that might be a conversation for another time as well. Uh, but what I, what I want to make sure folks really understand is think about what would cause you to take your child, six months years old, or your pregnant uh, uh, partner, your pregnant wife, and go through the jungle for six months, wade through water where everyone may die with nothing, try to make it here. Something must be going really wrong. And so I think we lose the humanity of each person by looking at the, the hordes of folks that they like to put out. But that's not a horde of folks. That's individual people who are running away from crisis. We as a nation tell other nations to open up their space and help refugees. Well, we have to do the same. And so we have to continue providing service humanely. We can't pit people against each other. That's not the way to do it. And we have the resources to do those things. Um, and also, what we're doing in New York City is unsustainable. 
And so we have to make sure that the governor steps up. She's doing a little bit now. Not clearly enough. She should be coordinating a statewide response. And I'm afraid President Biden has done almost nothing to help us. But, and that is putting more pressure on New York City for, for no reason. New York City can't solve the immigration problems. Um, and if New York City doesn't succeed, the state fails. So I'm really looking for both of those folks to really step up. Uh, what we can't do is change our right to shelter and change our laws. We have to keep those laws in place and do the best we can to provide humane and compassionate service to, to folks who really just need some help. Before we go to our next question, let me follow up. So what do you make, uh, Mr. Public Advocate, mm -hmm. of the surrounding counties who are drawing a line in the sand and actually trying to sue to stop New York City, which is overwhelmed uh, by the influx of migrants and arrivals, to move them to Rockland and Orange County and other counties? What do you make of that? It's not surprising based on who's doing it. And I always tell folks, we have to be careful with the us versus them messaging because today you're us, tomorrow you're them. And so we have to be very careful when we do that. Um, but I believe it's right here in that part is a failure of our governor to really coordinate a statewide response. It shouldn't be up to New York City to coordinate a statewide response because we're not the state. So the state really needs to step in here. We know there are people who have um, very bad responses to things like this, and we're seeing that. And it's, it's so unfortunate because folks who are just looking for assistance, many looking to work. Uh, and by the way, if we can change the work authorization, which is the, the president can do that right now, they would actually take jobs that nobody wants. Like their jobs are available right now, but nobody wants them. And, and industries are saying, look, please, can you change it? Because we can't fill these jobs in, in um, industries of manufacturing and farming. Um, but the president won't move. And so it, we need the governor to step up and definitely the president to step up. And we just have to remember these are human beings that are looking for some assistance. What would you do in that situation? And what, what do you make of the governor of Texas busing up to 1,000 per day to all black cities run by black mayors? It's disgusting. But, but you know, right now we have a, a GOP and we have a, a Republican leadership that's not rooted in humanity at all. It's rooted in, uh, it's, it's rooted in uplifting the worst that it's in us, the fear, uh, the division that can be sold in human nature. They don't want to make that better. They want to keep pushing and sowing. And, and I will say, and we in New York City now are feeling maybe what some of those cities have been feeling for a long time. The answer to that is to join us to try to get the immigration reform that we've been clamoring for, some national response. It's not to use human beings as bargaining chips, as widgets on the board, to try to uh, dis dis harm other cities. That's the wrong way to do it. Anytime you're doing that with human beings, you've made a wrong turn. Let's get to our final question right here from our member of a studio audience. Thank you so much, Public Advocate, for your Thank words. You. My name is Gia Lee. I'm a 23-year special education teacher in the New York public school system. I'm on sabbatical this year, so I'm able to make it. Uh, my question for you is in concern with the education budget situation, but specifically around early childhood education. Um, currently, the, an article just came out in Bloomberg Business Week that the mayor has uh, gutted their universal pre-K program. I'm wondering how we can support you and also what your role can help bring to shed light on the gutting of early childhood education in the city. Um, and there's also contracts that are being uh, vied for where this money is going to private contracts and taken away from uh, actual workers in the city, uh, specifically union members, UFT members. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm a, I'm a public school baby from preschool and masters, educated in uh, New York public school systems and know how important it is. It's a, it's a jewel. It's, it's got to be polished up sometimes. But um, I have a lot of concerns with the executive budget that's been presented, and I've been trying to support the work that the council is doing to really push back on that. But, um, I used to ask former administrations when they would come to hearings, when they were cutting educational uh, or, or youth jobs, and I would say, have you asked the police department how that would affect public safety? But the answer was usually no. And I would wonder if this administration has sat down with PD to talk about how this would, uh, uh, this would affect public safety, since that's where we usually go when there's a response. And what we do know is we have the funding that's needed. 
department. I wish uh, the mayor would have joined us in asking for additional uh, funds from the state, but he didn't. And, and it's hard to say you don't have funding, but then won't ask for additional uh, revenue raising, uh, revenue, won't support revenue raising ideas. Uh, but we know that the pre-K and 3K have been extraordinary successes. Some of the lack of success is how the program is being administered. Uh, the slots that were available didn't work for families who are working. And so what we need to do is adjust the program so it works best for, fo for families and not cut that type of funding. And so again, I would ask people to speak to their council members, um, come to the rallies, pay attention to what's going on, uh, reach out to the mayor's office, and make sure they understand that this is, this is not something that you know, is an aside. This is essential. Child care is essential for the city to move, for the workforce to keep going. And to gut those things at a time like this doesn't make sense. I have always said that the one thing we should be doing on behalf of all of the people we lost during COVID was to not go back to normal. Because normal is what got us here. But it seems like we're doing all of the things that we did before the pandemic. Um, and I think it's really sad. We have two minutes left, and let me just ask you to follow up on that. There are so many children who are arriving on those buses, and they are entering our public schools, and some of the schools admit that they're overwhelmed. What's your uh, message to principals and teachers and social workers who are trying to deal with this crisis in their schools? You know, when I talk about these things, I, I try to come from my own point of view. <laughs> And I feel the angst and anxiety and sometimes even the fear that people feel. Like, wait a minute, like my, this is all. And then what I try to do is unpack that. And then go back to, this is a child. This child just went through, likely, a very, very traumatic event. To try to run away from, from violence, run away from starvation. Like, what were they trying to run away from? So all I'm saying is let's at least come from that point of view and not from the them and us. It's very important. We are overwhelmed. This is unsustainable. But, but what I want to tell folks is we have to continue to do the best that we can uh, because that's who we are and should be as New York City, New York State, and as the United States of America. We need our president to step up in a way he has not, and we need our governor to do the same. Um, so my, my focus is I hope people really just remember uh, these are folks who need help, and we do the best we can with what we have where we are. Well, we know that all New Yorkers are doing their best to welcome the arrivals, and we'll get through it. We always do. Public advocate, I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank, thank our you. studio audience for being here. I think this was a very fruitful conversation. I'm Cheryl Wills. Good night.